Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Sarah Reyes, the Chief Communication Officer for the California Endowment, and we are proud to be a co-sponsor of today's uh, webinar, um, Latinos in the Media. On behalf of the endowment and UCLA Latino Politics and Policy Institute and our many speakers today, I wanna to thank you for joining us for this very important conversation. As a former journalist for many decades, it saddens me to think that we are still having the same conversation about the lack of representation of Latinos in the media, even today. While we may have had some improvements in the numbers since my days in journalism, it is still lagging behind. All you have to do is Google Latinos in the media and your queue will be filled with reports from so many organizations that speak directly to the small gains that have been made and the need to continue to work towards representation of Latinos in the media. Whether in television, print, broadcast, and even in Hollywood, Latinos are lacking in numbers across the board. And when you look at the positions of power in those mediums, you will see that Latinos are pretty non-existent. That is why today's conversation is so important. It's time to turn this around. As the Latino community becomes the majority in so many of our states across the country, it's time for us all to act and change the, these very sad and dismal numbers. That is why I am proud to be a part of the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Institute. UCLA LPPI has not just reported on the numbers, but has worked to improve the numbers of Latinos in the media. You will hear more about that during today's webinar. Our speakers are leaders who every day are taking action to ensure that Latinos are not invisible anymore. We at the California Endowment are pleased to support many organizations like UCLA LPPI and partner together to ensure equity for all. Now let's get to the conversation. Allow me to introduce to you first, Dr. Rodrigo Dominguez Villegas, who is the inaugural director of research at the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Institute and the director of the UC US Latino Data Hub, an interactive data tool that will be released this fall. He also directs research on Latino representation in elected and appointed offices, the judiciary, and yes, the media, and will situate our conversation today with the latest findings on research about Latino representation in the opinion pages of the Los Angeles Times. Rodrigo. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for this really important conversation. Uh, Sarah said, I'm going to present the findings of for a report that we published last week, which is a follow-up study of one we did in 2021 where we found that Latinos were grossly underrepresented in the editorial board, authorship, and content of op-eds in the LA Times. That report launched a unique partnership and lots of work that a lot of organizations have done that yielded some results as I'll show soon. To address that underrepresentation of Latinos, uh, LPPI reached out to the executive editor of the paper and the editor of the editorial pages to initiate discussions about the report's major findings. Uh, something that we found was that uh, the LA Times leadership was very open to um, get some feedback from us. And as a result of several discussions with the leadership of the LA Times, LBPI assembled a group of cross-sectoral, multi-generational Latina, Latino leaders to accelerate the growth of Latino representation across the paper. Beginning in April 2022, that's three months after we released the first report, these group of Latino leaders met regularly with LA Times executives, reporters, and other staff to share emerging stories relevant to the Latino community and provide expert perspectives on a range of issues from Latino representation in film and television to the preferences of Latino voters. This collaboration has created new information sharing channels between Latino leaders and communities and the LA Times, while also providing a forum for accountability and representation and inclusion of the paper. This follow-up report we just published is a scorecard, if you will. It is our way to not only track progress, but to ensure accountability from the paper. So in case you're new to our reports, haven't uh, read them yet, what questions do we answer with our research? 
Through very rigorous methodology and lots of data analysis, we answered these questions. What share of the LA Times editorial board members are Latina Latino? What proportion of op-eds in the LA Times were authored by Latinos? And to what extent do opinion editorials published by the LA Times focus on Latinos? And of course, today I'm gonna to present the answers to these three questions on how those three changed since 2021. So what did we find? Well, first, Latino representation in the editorial board of the LA Times increased from 11.1% in 2021 to 37.5% in 2022. This is outstanding progress in just one year and takes representation in the editorial board to be on par with the Latino population of California, but still under the makeup of LA County where Latinos are the largest group at around 50% of the population. In terms of authorship of op-eds, the severe underrepresentation we found in 2021 continued in 2022 as only 10% of all op-eds published in 2022 were authored by a Latina or a Latino. However, this is more than double the 4.3% of op-eds authored by Latinos in 2021. A large increase, but authorship of op-eds by Latinos would need to multiply by five in order to reach parity with LA's county population. Now, Latina representation in authorship is even worse, with less than 6% of op-eds published in 2022 having at least one Latina author. This is up from the 1.4% written by Latinas in 2021, but it is important to note that we estimate that more than 50% of op-eds authored by Latinas in 2022 were written by Jean Guerrero, who was hired as a columnist in 2021. And as admirable as Jean's work is, the paper needs to improve the inclusion of a diverse set of Latina leaders and writers in op-eds. And last, in terms of representation in content of op-eds, 88.2% of op-eds published by the LA Times in 2022 did not explicitly mention Latinos at all. This is down from around 95%, so there's some improvement again, uh, but there is still tons to be done, right? This invisibility of California's largest demographic group is likely to shape policy debates that do not consider the specific needs of Latinos in the state or the country at large. So, what do we need to do to improve this? We offered five concrete and actionable steps to retain the talent that the LA Times has and increase representation of Latinos in op-eds. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, three that are particularly important are, number one, expanding the editorial board and strengthening hiring and retention practice to ensure that the perspectives for Latinos and other communities of color are included at the strategic tables of the opinion and editorial section uh, for years to come. So we don't wanna see any setbacks uh, because of layoffs or anything like that. Number four, creating strong partnerships with the University of California, the California State University and the California Community College Systems through training programs, practicums, fellowships to encourage the penmanship and submission of op opinion pieces by a new generation of, of young leaders. Our young people in California and the rest of the country are majority um, people of color. And so focusing on how are we going to get these people of color to write more um, through creating really important uh, channels for that will be important. And then, you know, as a researcher, of course, I uh, um, it, it's always uh, number five, creating an enhancing transparent data collection is really important um, as, uh, you know, understanding how diversity is changing within the staff of the paper, but also in the submission and um, publication of um, op-eds is important. So thank you so much. Um, I can get into more detail uh, in the Q&A, but now I have the honor to introduce Congressman Joaquin Castro. Congressman Joaquin Castro is currently in his sixth uh, term representing his hometown, uh, hometown of San Antonio, Texas in the US House of Representatives in Congress. His work centers on expanding what he calls the infrastructure of opportunity, the great public schools and universities, sound healthcare system, and good paying jobs that allow people to pursue their American dreams. A former chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and a proud Mexican American, Castro is the highest ranking Democrat on the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee with jurisdiction over Western Hemisphere Affairs. 
Prior to his election to Congress, he served five terms in the Texas state legislature, where he transcended partisan gridlock to help restore millions of dollars of funding to critical healthcare and education programs. As vice chairman of the Higher Education Committee and Democratic floor leader in the Texas House, he was also at the forefront of proposing forward-thinking legislative reforms in the areas of mental health, teen pregnancy, and juvenile justice. Castro is a proud father of three and lives in San Antonio with his family. Pass it on to you, Congressman. Uh, thank you so much. And I apologize that my time will be about two minutes uh, just because of the timing of everything going on. I've got to go speak on behalf of a Californian, Adam Schiff, as we're doing a censure resolution. I'm just right off the House floor. But I wanted to, to join you all because this is an incredibly important topic. Thank you to LPPI and everybody who's discussing it today. Uh, for the last four years, I've worked very hard uh, on Latino representation across different media platforms. I know many of you have worked much longer than I have on these issues, uh, but American media is still the main uh, narrative creating and image defining institution in the United States and therefore I believe in the world. And so it matters from Hollywood to hard news that Latinos and Latinas are represented in the newsroom, which in turn will affect the amount of coverage the community gets and the type of coverage the community gets. Uh, for too long, the Latino narrative has been missing from the larger American narrative. And more than being just culturally inconvenient, there's actually a very deep price that we pay for that. Because in that black hole of narrative, in that missing story, when Mar Americans don't know, even many in our own community, uh, don't know what contributions we've made uh, to American society, all of the stereotypes from mass media fill in that lack of knowledge. Uh, and so the work that you're doing uh, in your own organizations, those of you that are journalists, uh, but also those of you that are advocates, the work that you're doing is helping to fill in the Latino narrative and make sure that it's part of the larger American narrative. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I hope that I'll have a chance at another time to join you for a little bit longer period uh, when it's not so uh, hectic in Congress, uh, but just wanted to say thank you so much. Take, take care, y'all. Thank you so much, Congressman Castro, for, for joining us. I'm Yvette Cabrera. I am a reporter for the Center for Public Integrity. I cover social and economic inequalities with a focus on environmental justice issues. And I'm currently president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. Um, I also happen to be based here in California. I'm currently in Santa Barbara, but worked um, in the Los Angeles area for many years. Um, both uh, started my career as a trainee reporter at the Los Angeles Times. Times. I worked at the Los Angeles Daily News um, and uh, also worked as a columnist at the Orange County Register for many years as well. Um, I, I'm very proud to be here today. Um, NHJ um, is part of the ongoing discussions with Congressman Castro's Latino Advisory Leadership Council. Um, we firmly believe that to address disparities in news coverage, as well as hiring in newsrooms, that we must first have the data as a benchmark. Diversity data helps newsrooms hold themselves accountable. It helps organizations like NHJ and our ally journalism groups to understand where we can bridge the gaps. So we very much appreciate the baseline that the GAO Workforce Diversity Report um, has established on the media and that this UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Institute report has also laid out so clearly. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce the rest of our panelists joining us today, in addition to Dr. Rodrigo Dominguez-Villegas. First, we have Viviana Lopez-Green, who is the Senior Director of the Racial Equity Initiative at Unidos US, which is the largest Hispanic civil rights and advocacy organization in the United States. She designs and leads the initiative, which aims to ensure the full inclusion of Latinos in the public discourse on systemic inequality. She previously served as senior director of affiliate engagement during which she developed leadership and communication initiatives to change Latino narratives with a focus on systemic inequality, inclusion in US history books and news coverage of Latinos. Welcome Viviana. 
We are also joined by Angel Rodriguez, who is an assistant managing editor and the general manager for Latino initiatives at the Los Angeles Times, overseeing a new product, Delos, that will explore Latino culture and identity. Angel began this work in 2022 after two years as a special projects editor. He manages a team looking to build on the success of the Latinx Files newsletter, working to bring to life the vibrancy of the US Latino experience. Delos aims to reach Latino audiences with visual and audio storytelling, with provocative commentary, short documentaries, and live events. Angel also manages Los Angeles Times in Espanol as part of a continuing effort to better serve Southern California's Spanish speaking market. Viviana, um, I'd like to start with you to help provide some context as to what are the risks of failing to address the gaps in coverage, in voice, perspectives, in the op-ed pages, and in the paper as a whole. Um, we just faced one of the greatest health threats of our time, the COVID pandemic, which put a spotlight on existing health disparities within black and brown communities across the country that were especially hard hit by COVID. Um, I wanted to see if you can expand on a point made in the report regarding the lack of nuanced coverage of Latinos in the media, coverage that fails to get at structural inequities and racial inequality, what is the impact of the underrepresentation of Latinos in the news? Buenas tardes a todos y muchísimas gracias, Yvette. It is a pleasure to be here, and I want to start by saying congrats to Dr. Rodrigo and, of course, the LA Times opinion page for the collaboration and the entire EPPI team for their incredible work documenting this. As Yvette said, this is very important because we can fix what we don't know or can measure. So, Yvette, um, the short answer to your question about the impact of um, real world impact about underrepresentation in the media, both as sources and news creators, is that when newsrooms don't reflect the community they represent or a large segment of the US population, the stories and coverage are incomplete, are inaccurate. And this inaccuracy is extremely problematic although as our report shows, it's not surprising. And this is where I would like to take one minute to just expand and create that context of why. So there are two findings from our study called From Invisibility to Inclusion, Elevating Latino Voices in News about Racial, Just, about racial Equity that Unidos US released this past March in partnership with Berkeley Media Studies Group. These findings explain that less than 6% of news related to racial equity reference Latino, and Latino constitutes nearly 20% of all Americans and over 40% of all people of color in the US. These numbers are not shocking given that only 11% of news analysts, reporters, and journalists are Latinos, as documented in the report that our Congressman, uh, Representative Joaquin Castro just referenced, you know, the Government Accountability Office report. We know also that the powerful role that the media and entertainment industry play on creating that main, defining the image and narrative of our society. So this blind spot, about Latinos has a huge and negative impact, which makes it very hard for our community to make the case for, pu for, for public policy solutions that will benefit them and will create solutions that are equitably for our country. One more addition here is that we believe that this inaccuracy creates fertile ground for toxic narratives and perceptions of our community. So if people don't know who we are, it is easy just for others to use a broad brush that is not accurate. So that is the first finding. The second finding that uh, tells us the, the real world impact of this um, underrepresentation is that the study found that there is no recognition of Latino agency. And this came out in two significant ways. One is that in the few instances, that 6% in which Latinos were covered 
and the stories about racial equity issues facing the Latino, they tended to highlight mostly problems. Only 40% of the articles focus on solutions. This framing for the stories is also troublesome. When news highlight only on problems without exploring solutions, people, you know, the average citizen, and more importantly, including policymakers, have a harder time envisioning next steps. Readers, the consumer, need to see the work that folks, their local leaders, their advocates in their municipalities, in their cities are doing to improve their communities. Those are the kind of stories that encourage action and that instill hope in our country. And the second part of that piece is, of course, that rarely in that in those stories where Latinos were covered, you know, there were any Latinos used as sources. Nobody spoke from a lived experience. There were not authentic voices. So the impact here, what is important is that this is not just a problem for Latinos and not seeing themselves reflected in the media. This is, we believe, and this is documented in the study that this is a problem for our country. This is a problem for the whole American uh, public because the readers are not getting a full picture and therefore you're not gonna understand 20% of the population of your country. So again, policymakers will not be able to create or craft solutions that will benefit the whole country. Thank you. Thank you, Viviana. Um, this is a good place to transition um, to, to your work, Angel, because you oversee Latino initiatives. Um, I uh, remember the days when the late, great Frank Del Olmo um, oversaw uh, one of the, the biggest Latino initiatives at the paper to try to ensure that Latino reporters and editors were working and tackling topics across a broad range from religion to politics. Um, and so I know that there has been great work done by the LA Times over the years to, to try to respond to the needs of the community. But um, I, I'm hoping that you can talk about specifically about your time there, the work that you the work that you have underway to ensure that within the Latin, the LA Times newsroom, um, there is a responsiveness to the communities um, it, within LA County, within Southern California, California itself as a whole. Um, and also how, how are you addressing that with, um, with the staff itself? As we all know, there was a recent announcement about layoffs across the newsroom at the LA Times that will be impacting a significant number of Latino journalists at the paper. So I'm wondering if you can talk about both those things. What are the efforts underway um, and how will you do that with uh, fewer resources? Yeah, I, I, first off, thanks for having me on the panel and thanks to the UCLA, UCLA LPI, uh, LPPI uh, group uh, for hosting this and giving us the opportunity to talk. Um, obviously, the news of a couple of weeks ago was difficult for a lot of us. Um, we've lost 75 or, or will lose 75 colleagues in the newsroom. Um, 19 of those, if I have the numbers correctly, are Latino. So obviously, some of the advancements that even Rodrigo mentioned in his report and some of the advancements that we, we've we made overall on the staff, um, you know, we took might have taken two steps forward and a step back here. Um, when we talk, we'll probably talk a lot about percentages and numbers and those things, um, but those 75 colleagues have lives and families and mortgages. And so as much as we talk about the advancements and everything, I think it's really important to to highlight those, those friends and colleagues that we're going to lose and, and how we um, uh, recover from that and how we continue to try to do the good work that we're doing. And so obviously for us it, in this initiative, it's a little bit of, of a difficult timing as we're, as we're, you know, uh, really trying to move forward, um, with some of the initiatives, um, that, that were put forth by this group initially, um, in 2020, when we started, we, you know, we've really taken a lot of the discussions, um, that came out of that group and and move that forward. Um, and you know, for those that have been on that call, I know Sarah was probably on a lot of those calls. Or Rodrigo might have been on those calls. Um, th they weren't the easiest conversations. Sometimes it was it was you know, especially early on, there was a lot of um, um, righteous anger at the coverage traditionally from from Black and Brown communities that the LA Times has had. 
Um, and you know, we took those to heart. And a lot of the things that that Congressman Castro and other elected officials in those groups raised, we we really gave us the the sort of the the impetus to kind of move forward. And and for some of us that had been kind of preaching the, the, this need to to have a, a more representative newsroom, it, it was music to our ears that other people were saying that to our leaders. And so it made our job actually easier. And so as we build this this product. Um, you know, the idea came out of a lot of the things that were, that were have been highlighted in Rodrigo's report, and then just overall, um, you know, traditionally our paper, um, and, and you know, you can say our paper. It, it's it's extrapolate that out into um, overall uh, U.S. media has largely uh, made us invisible um, in a lot of ways. Um, we are. In a lot of in a lot of ways, our newspaper was a, a it is a newspaper, and we're trying to move that along. That was written by a largely um, a white staff for a largely white audience, and so one of the things that we're really trying to focus on is being a lot more representative of the community that we live in. And so, the loss is one piece of that. It's not one you know. There's not a magic bullet that this this um, this group of us that are working on this project can solve. That's it's a newsroom wide effort. Um, and so what we're trying to do is really be the accelerator in a lot of ways for what we're doing. I think um, we've what we've started doing is really um, working collaboratively with other departments in the newsroom to kind of get them as well to, to work on uh, being more responsive. And I think overall we've we've seen that um, in a lot of the work being done. And I think specifically um, since uh, our new executive editor came in a couple of years ago, um, uh, Kevin Merida, I think we've seen increases in both representation and storytelling. I was on a call uh, recently with uh, Montezuma de Sparza, and, and he's not one to mince words. And he, before the, the conversation we were having, he, he mentioned, he's like, I don't know what's happening at the LA Times, but it's not the paper I remember. These last couple of years, um, you know, I'm seeing stories that reflect the community that are that 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 have sources that are Latino, all those things. And so if we if we were able to get some some positive feedback from him, who's who's been a longstanding critic of the LA Times, we feel it, it feels like it's 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 a positive step forward. Right. And so with Delos, what we're really trying to do is focus on those audiences that traditionally have not come to the LA Times, which is the younger audience. Um, which uh, has not had a need to come to the LA Times. We've, they've not felt reflected in the pages of the LA Times. When they have been reflected in the LA Times, it's usually been um, negatively. Um, and so we realize that we need to rebuild bridges with, with the Latino community. And so um, given the population and, and the, the center that we live in, in terms of the, the, the Latino cap, one of the Latino capitals of the world, we really are focusing on reaching those younger audiences and bringing them into the LA Times to realize, yes, you know, we're changing. We we have a we have a, a, a not great track record of covering, covering Black and Brown communities traditionally, and so we we understand that we need to to build those bridges. And so that's what this group is doing, working in hand in hand with other Latino leaders, other Latino uh, staffers, the Latino Caucus of the of the LA Times. And so we hope that this um, is is one piece of a larger puzzle of of actually being a, a newsroom that is much more reflective of the of the community that we live in. Thank you. Um, Rodrigo, back to the op-ed pages. Um, as you noted, there were some significant gains in in hiring on the editorial board, but there's still a wide gap in terms of op-ed submissions from Latinos and Latinas in particular. Um, I wanted to see if you could talk about um, the ad hoc committee that was formed. What were the asks? Um, what did the Times pledge um, to address? And how would you describe the results of those efforts? You know, have they provided a measure of accountability? Thank you very much. And this is a question that both I think um, myself and Angel can can talk about. Um, so some of the specific asks that we that we uh, put in front of the LA Times leadership was uh, for them to invest in actually reaching out to our communities when there were specific issues that were uh, particularly impacting Latino communities and commission um, op-eds, et cetera, with you know, our guidance, we, we were the connection to a lot of people who were able to write or produce these op-eds. But one of the asks was to be much more intentional about uh, reaching out to our communities to increase that uh, submission. The other important ask was that of transparency. And that's where I think the LA Times has 
uh, you know, as many organizations uh, not being as uh, forthcoming. And so some something that's important to, to track uh, that we cannot track based on the, what is publicly available is what are the what do the submissions look like? Right. People submit op eds. Who are those authors? And then what proportion of those get actually gets published? And what's the criteria to decide that? Right. Something that we've been pushing a lot for is to be intentional about the criteria uh, that leads to the decision to publish or not publish a specific submission. Uh, an import, so that was an important ask, right? Change your uh, criteria, train your staff. We report on the composition of the editorial board, but there's a lot of staff that is under the editorial board uh, that actually is the one, you know, are the ones who are receiving submissions, reading them, deciding who, what gets published, what doesn't get published. Doing intentional work with that staff in training them more about the uh, needs of Latino communities, understanding Latino communities, and diversifying that staff is another important ask uh, where some progress has been made, but but again, there's a lot more room um, for improvements. And those, those are, I think, are the most important immediate asks besides the one that we're making right now, which is we need to maintain progress. We cannot, as, as, as Angel said, go two steps forward, one step back anymore. And we need to be very creative and collaborative in you know, helping make, making sure that that progress continues and accelerates. Angel, did you want to also respond to that? Yeah, I think it's really important. I think Rodrigo goes actually right. I think is is actually, you know, I, I don't see those numbers that come in either since I don't work in that department um, in terms of the submissions. Um, but it is one that is really important about also um, giving people the, 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 the know-how of how to actually submit to it. Like, you, you know, it's, it's one thing we talk a lot about the pipeline, you know, there's this whole thing about pipeline issue and diversity, which we don't, I, I personally don't think is, is a, is a problem. We do have qualified Latino journalists out there that sometimes just don't get hired. Um, but you know, there might be without having looked at that all that closely, there might be issues of like, I don't even know how to do this process or, or how, how to get that done, or are they even going to, you know, take mine because we don't. So I think there's, there's a lot of outreach that probably needs to happen from our end as well to ensure that we're doing the, 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 um, following the processes and things that we need to do to improve those numbers. Um, in the sense of, uh, you know, making it much easier to, to know how to actually submit one or um, be more responsive in the emails when those come in. Um, and, and I know, you know, just from our um, internal discussions, uh, Terry Tang, who runs the editorial board, is really cognizant of that and, and really took to heart a lot of the things that came out of the initial discussion. And I think that's kind of borne out in some of the numbers and the improvements. Obviously, we all can improve. Um, um, across the board on, on seeing, you know, the, I, I specifically wrote down the, the issue of Latina representation, which I think is really important um, as well. And so, you know, I think, I think it's just, it, it, it's, 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 it's a multifaceted approach to continue getting it. Cause with a lot of these things, we're never going to get to the point where it's like, oh, we got it. We, we won. And now we can take the foot off the accelerator. Right. We never, we never really win. It's a con, you know, making sure that we're, we're a diverse newsroom and, and that we're a representative newsroom. It's a constant work, right? We never say we're, we've won or we can never say we've lost because there's always opportunities to do more. And so I think, I think there's just, that's a long way of saying like that there's probably a lot of different things that we can do internally to kind of improve that process. Uh, yeah, and speaking of process, there's a question from uh, Yesenia Resendiz Torres. We're, we are going to get to questions later on, um, but I, I do want to note that she's asking, you know, she's, um, you know, a uh, first generation Latina, recently graduated with a BA in criminology. She has a passion for social justice. She's asking, can non-journalists, uh, non-journalism students help contribute to the effort of opinion piece submissions? And I think it speaks to that lack of clarity to the process for submitting. Um, Angel, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think those things are open to everyone who has a, 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 a valid opinion. Obviously, those things are vetted. And, and, you know, if it's a, we want to include people that have some authority on certain topics, but they're open. What I'd also uh, suggest, you know, I think, I think was posted in the chat, the, the Los page, one of the things that we've been really focusing on 
in the los is is the community aspect of it is getting contributions from the community um and so you know there we are open to pitches there it's been one of the focuses that we've really done about you know trying to be listening to the community not just like writing about them but writing for them and that means bringing them into the process as we build this um so i think in that link there is ways to pitch us and ways to file or submit story ideas for us to follow up on and we're taking that to heart one of the things that was mentioned in the bio one of the things that we've learned um from the Latinx files, which is in a lot of ways, the newsletter was very much a, a kind of proof of concept, both internally and externally for what we're doing with Delos, was that 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 ability to, we would do something called Meet the Reader, which gave the ability for readers to submit little things and little little topics that explain their Latinidad. And so depending on the topic, you know, there's any number of ways to pitch us stories. Great, thank you. Um, this next question um, is for both Rodrigo and Viviana, um, because this issue um, and the challenges that the report is trying to address within the LA Times is not just an issue um, uh, relevant here in Southern California. It's, a, it's an issue facing news organizations across the country. Um, Rodrigo, I wanted to see if you could um, talk about the numbers for some of the other uh, newspapers that you compared the LA Times to, um, there are some significant shortcomings um, in some of our largest papers. Um, and Viviana, um, after Rodrigo speaks, I wanted to see if you can discuss any concerns that you may have, you know, um, with this lack of representation on the op-ed pages um, in newspapers across the country, what you see as far as the impact of the failure to give a voice to those perspectives on in the op-ed pages or even the editorial page as well. Rodrigo. Yeah, so we also followed the uh, Latino, the represent the racial and ethnic composition of the editorial boards of four other comparable newspapers. Um, and so it's important to place the LA Times in context with others, right? In 2021, the LA Times had the largest representation gap. We define representation gap as the difference between the proportion of Latinos in the editorial board and the proportion of Latinos of the population that that paper is in. In 2021, the LA Times had the largest out of the five that we uh, studied, which are include the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Miami Herald, and the Dallas Morning News. Uh, by 2022, because the LA Times hired two new members that, are, that were Latino, Latino into their editorial board, that gap shrank significantly in the LA Times. However, in the other newspapers, even though in 2021 they were doing better than the LA Times, there was no progress or there was regression uh, between 2021 and 2022. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, the representation gap increased for the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, state constant for the Miami Herald and the Dallas Morning News did um, decrease that representation gap between the two years that we that we studied. Wow. Oh, go ahead. You're done. Okay. So, so Viviana, uh, can you address the the content aspect of this? I, I'm really interested in also hearing more about um, the 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 lack of uh, coverage, you know, whether it's on the news side or um, in the uh, on the editorial pages, in the op-ed pages, um, on issues that affect um, Latinos, um, whether it's like racial equity um, or racism, um, because when we have these discussions, you know, post George Floyd, there's been a lot of great journalism that has come, a lot of great coverage that has come from putting that lens on. Um, you know, racial profiling or criminal justice issues. Um, there's a lot of great coverage in that area. Is it is it inclusive of what is happening in the Latino community? Well, I think there is more and more, but not enough to represent the demographics and the importance of the Latino community as it relates, you know, to our economy, to the country's economy, to the workforce. And so that's why it is important to put all the puzzles, all the pieces of this puzzle together. And so, uh, yes, we've seen, you know, some uh, increase and um, improvements. And 
for us, similar to what Rod Dr. Rodrigo mentioned in the findings, you know, in our study about Latino representation in news on racial equity, we saw some similar gaps, you know, the, for example, generally news uh, out of California, they had the highest volume, but they were, you know, less than 60%. So uh, included Latino. So that have long way to go. Um, Texas is especially notable because it has a high Latino population, but the cover is still very, you know, severely lacking. Less than 5% of racial equity articles published in Texas outlets mention Latinos. Wow. So that is uh, considering, I think Texas is 40% of the state residents identifies as Latinos or Hispanic. So you can say this is, this is severe. Um, some states had so little coverage of Latinos <laughs> that they barely register in our study. So of course that includes states like Maine, Montana. So, you know, but of course there is a lower Latino population there. So that, you know, there's still a lot of work to do. And I think that um, Yvette um, and Angel was getting to this. There is a, you know, as advocates, we think that we, we can do better, you know, in helping the community leaders that can be sources and authentic voices uh, for these stories to be able to access the media. I think there is a special role for activists and advocates uh, to do that. Um, it is important for Latinos themselves to, you know, to tell their own story, how these issues of housing, health, education, as you mentioned, during the COVID pandemic, no one talked about the impact of the pandemic in our communities. So I think um, we, we have an opportunity here to, to either work with philanthropy and with the media outlets to provide this training to these Latino leaders. Again, Unidos US has almost 300 affiliates across the country, CEOs, community leaders that are experts that are working, that are inside the community, working in all these issues impacting uh, our, our population. So if they need to create these connections with their local media outlets and not just wait for a story to be pitched or for an emergency, you know, they need to cultivate this and we need to provide that training so they can tell the stories accurately. Um, we can also talk about, you know, as what Rodrigo was saying, what happens inside the leadership of the editorial room. I think there is an opportunity here also for, um, you know, the newspapers to take a look about who is making the editorial calendar, who decides what stories are getting published, who decides, who makes a strategic decision when there is a disagreement. So there is a lot of conversations that are already happening. And as you mentioned, Yvette, this is uh, they're under the microscope under, after the pandemic. We have a lot, you know, there's been a studies before 2020, but it will be interesting to go back to see uh, how, you know, the baseline that we are creating with these studies improve. So before we get to um, uh, questions in a few minutes from the audience, um, I wanted to see if we could, um, if the three of you could discuss uh, potential solutions to the steps that newsrooms um, can take to um, address these these gaps. And um, Angel, I wanted to see if we could start, start with you um, uh, specifically pathways that you see um, to encourage, nurture uh, potential talent within your newsroom um, to not only um, cover these issues on the news side, but also possibly take steps um, onto the editorial pages. I think we have a great example in Tony Barbosa, who had covered um, environmental issues for the paper, now writing for the editorial board. Um, can you talk about those pathways and what, what's happening at that level? Yeah, I think it's super critical. The 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 pathway issue is one that's super critical. Like one of the things that I uh, that I think we've tr in the last couple of years have struggled a little bit with at the LA Times is we've been doing a little bit better in terms of of, of diverse hiring um, journalists of color, uh, but retention has become a big problem, right? And so um, what we are trying to do, and, and one of the one of the the benefits of this project in in Delos is really 
is in, is trying to create pathways for the journalists that are in our organization to advance in their careers because that is that is critical. One of the the things that you know with this project, we've we've it's going to be a staff of eleven. We've been able to give promotions to six uh, Latino staffers, hired four externally. So th that's a process. And then obviously that needs to extend out into other areas of the newsroom as well, right? We have to be able to provide pathways to. Um, for career advancement for our Latino journalists or else we're, we're going to continue to lose them to the uh, Washington Post, New York Times, or or any other outlet out there that is giving them opportunities. So for us, it's super critical that we uh, not just do a good job on the front end, which is getting Latinos into the newsroom, but making sure that we are caring for them once they're in, in terms of how their career wants to progress and making sure. One of the things that I would always ask um, our, our whatever we'd hire a journalist or come in um, I, I was formerly the sports editor. It was like, so what's your next job look like? So I wanted to know from the very beginning what the career aspirations were for those journalists that we were bringing in, because a lot of ways what ends up happening um, in, in journalism is the jobs open up very quickly. There's, you know, movement and, and you know, you have to hire very quickly. And so understanding where people want to take their careers, I think is critical. And so that's on leaders to ask those questions to say, yes, you know, this person has an interest in becoming, if they're a reporter and becoming an editor, if they're an editor running a department, like all those different things are, are really important in order to really understand um, how we can improve the numbers at the higher end. Because I think that is also critical. I think Sarah mentioned at the beginning that in a lot of cases, um, the leadership in newsrooms are, are still, um, way below what they need to be. One of the good things, our, 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 our leadership group at the LA Times is 58% journalists of color, which is really great. It's only 25% Latino. That needs to improve, but there's, there's, there's progress there. And so when we talk about diversity and, and making sure that we have a diverse newsroom, that process is, is, is every day, right? It's not just bringing people in, it's ensuring that they, that they have opportunities to, to advance. And so for us, it's really about making sure that leaders understand that, that, that just by bringing in a Latino staffer or a black staffer, an Asian staffer and, and saying, oh, I've done my job, it's over. No, that's that's where the work actually starts, right? Is making sure that then they have opportunities to advance. Yep. And Rodrigo, can you talk about um, accountability measures? Um, how, can, how can the work that the ad hoc committee um, uh, has done, how can that be um, replicated across the country in other in other newspapers? Well, it'll, it'll be important to, kind of like understand this is a, a really unique case study that we are pushing with the LA Times and understand what has worked well. Angel mentioned difficult conversations at the beginning, but I think we all came into the room understanding that we are mature enough and understanding of the problem enough that we were be, we were able to go to get past those difficult conversations. It's really important uh, to kind of like cater this model to different contexts. Not all the contexts are the same, not all media markets are the same, but the disposition to change has to be there. That is a, a common thing that has is a, a, a baseline. I wanna address something uh, else that Angel and that um, was mentioned before. Angel mentioned about, uh, it, and that you even asked us, how, how can we improve better? I improve even more uh, and faster, I think, at least in the editorial section, opinion and editorial sections, right? Angel mentioned something about, uh, you know, submissions get published uh, many times, uh, you know, get selected by the, the by those who have the authority to talk about an issue. Redefining who has authority to talk about an issue is really key, right? Uh, many times, it's a very elitist uh, understanding of who has that authority. Right, I have a, a, a position of, of privilege in that. In that, I you know I have a PhD, and when I write about something, given the studies that I have, uh, in so, in in some places that is seen as a place of authority, but that should not be the case, right? So let me give you an example. Rocio Perez, she just graduated as a master with her master's from UCLA, but three years ago she wrote an op-ed titled, My Immigrant Parents Lost Their Jobs, But the CARES Act Won't Help Mixed Status Families Like Me. Lived experience of what was happening to her family that really talked about how we excluded millions of people from the funds that were distributed uh, to, to uh, recover from the pandemic. And, but that is just 
an exception. It should be the rule. It shouldn't be the exception. So lived experience, community experience, right? Uh, our uh, leaders have like just a lot of experience. Why weren't um, more opinion pieces uh, published, written by people who lead community clinics on how to distribute the vaccine, right? If those ideas have been pushed out earlier, we would have done so much better in making sure that the vaccine really got to our communities early and quickly. And so really finding who has the authority to write and publish is really key. Absolutely. That's a really good point, Brother Bean. Yep. Yeah. We oftentimes talk about diversity in, in terms of uh, race, ethnicity, gender, um, but so, so, so important to have diversity of thought, perspective, and experience, um, in, both in terms of the journalists covering these communities, but also um, the people that we're, we're writing about. Um, Viviana, the same question to you, uh, but in terms of like what you see um, uh, as far as um, being able to progress on this issue, what would you like to see a year from now, um, you know, two, three, five years from now, what would you see as success um, in terms of the the changes and the transformation happening at at the LA Times, but also in other newspapers across the country, I think we need to leverage uh, a lot of expertise in the way that it was defined, just defined by Rodrigo. That is already happening in the community. Uh, a good example would be to elevate all of our Latino researchers and all the uh, research that is happening in 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 our universities and centers like LPPI or the work that, it, that is going on. So how do we elevate that? And so that that also informs and educates uh, journalists. So I think, you know, expanding that, that will expand uh, the understanding of racial equity and how Latinos are affected. So there is an opportunity there. And some of these researchers, they're not necessarily, again, like advocates, they're not necessarily trained to share the, the knowledge that they have on the community and the studies with the media. So I think there is an opportunity that will ex expand the coverage and, and as well as the richness of the sources. Um, I also think that, for example, um, we there is a lot to do with textbooks. Uh, we just um, a month ago published uh, a study that indicates that most U.S. Uh, history books in high school fall very short on uh, Latino history, basic essential facts about the Latino contributions to the making of this country, to the deep roots of Latinos in this country. They are not covered. So this creates a foundational problem. And if we can work, you know, advocates and publishers and teachers and school boards and districts to change this you know, we will have journalists that come to their jobs with knowledge. I think people are coming, and this is also a call for action for journalism schools. You know, how are they how they're training their the, the journalists on racial equity issues and and a specific things? So I think there is a call here for you know everybody has a lot on their plates, but we all have to do the hard work of of learning, and we have to provide that baseline through textbooks and I invite you to all you know we have a lot of actionable steps on both reports the report that we did with John Hopkins University Institute for Education Policy on textbooks and our report with Berkeley Media Study Groups so and one thing uh Yvette that I think is going to give give us a, a roadmap and hope is also that we now have approval from Congress to build a museum for um, the, La the American Latino. So that is a big, also a big step, you know, that will create a foundation and a lot of sources and knowledge that will be accessed to every U.S. citizen, every U.S. resident. Absolutely. Um, to get to some of the questions from, um, from our audience, um, Evelyn Rodriguez asks, um, she says a lot of young people are turning away from newspapers to be informed. Why are newspapers still important for our communities to be represented in as staff and in content? Um, Angel, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I think when we when we talk about newspapers, we need to change what we talk about what a newspaper is. Um, you know, we we have more digital subscribers uh, to our digital offerings than we do have print subscribers. So when we talk about newspapers, we need to change the concept that it's just the printed, you know, the printed page. And that's one of the things that we were really focusing on 
with with our project is understanding where the younger given that our our audience that we're trying to go after are Gen Z and millennial English language dominant Latinos. What we really need to do is be on the platforms that they are. And so, you know, we're hard on Instagram and TikTok and social media, um, understanding how people consume audiences. And we have all that data that like that data comes to us. We know exactly how many people are coming to our stories and reading our stories. And so as print declines, which is, is a clear, it's clearly in decline and, and, you know, uh, it's, that's not a surprise to anyone that has picked up a newspaper in the last uh, year or so about how much different they are than they were before. Um, and so we just need to change the idea of what a newspaper is. And for us, it's really a news gathering organization. And so we still, um, we, you know, we're still the largest news gathering operation west of, you know, we like to say west of the Potomac, uh, because it's, the, you know, Washington Post and the New York Times. So for us, it's it's that concept, right, is we still have the ability to, you know, to, even given the recent layoffs we have, we over five, we have over 500 journalists working at the LA Times. And so that that megaphone and that uh, ability that we have to cover stories, if it's if it's the shooting in Uvalde, Texas, or if it's stuff that the city council leaks, we have the ability to cover those stories and cover those stories well. And so, I, we just want to need to probably change the, the 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 concept of what a newspaper really is. Uh, Juan Esparza Luera asks, do having more Latino journalists and more stories published about the Latino community result in increased circulation? Could I tackle? Yeah, that? I think that's yeah, perfect. yeah. Um, well, you know, again, that circulation is is a print dynamic, and we're we've moved away from from looking at circulation as a as a as a barometer for our success. We're really looking at digital subscriptions and subscribers, um, and so you know, we have to realize that covering our community and having more journalists and being more reflective of the community that we live in is better for the bottom line of the LA Times, because we're being more reflective of the community. And so what we need to do, going back to what I said earlier, is build those bridges, because we, we realize there's a generation of people that don't feel like they need to come to the LA Times. And so we need to do a better job of changing what the image and, and of the LA Times is, and, and really focus on those stories that matter to the community. So for us, you know, I, I think it's 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 super critical that that uh, that there is an increase in 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 not circulation, but subscribers and, and different things, just because that's what we're banking on in our project. Even though our project is going to be free, it's going to be in front of the paywall. So you're not going to have to pay for our product initially. And that was done intentionally because we didn't want to feel like, you know, hey, the other times is doing this project for Latinos, and then we're going to charge them $9.99 a month for it. Like that's not really rebuilding a bridge to the community that we've that we've uh, in some cases maligned for decades, right? And so we, we're putting that in front of the paywall. So we feel like if we authentically cover a community that those community members will then see a need to support us. Um, and that is you know, down the line buying a subscription or, or however other levers of, of revenue that we're able to drive from it. Thank you. Um, and we only have time for one last question. Um, I do wanna note that a lot of the questions um, are related to process. Um, so we'll save the chat um, uh, for you, especially uh, Angel, because uh, folks are asking like how to how to pitch and op-ed submission and, and that sort of thing. So um, I, I think as we referred to earlier, it's, it's important to make that clear for the community. Um, so the last question um, for Viviana, um, from Jaime Garcia, news and reporting is directly correlated to education and representation slash interaction at the local level. How would you recommend we leverage local resources like public libraries and local papers that are immersed in these local Latino populations? I think at the local level, as I mentioned before, it's, a, it's important for you know school boards, uh, parent teachers association, to connect with, with the media, with their local news outlet and understand who is covering Latinos, how they're covering Latino, who is already doing that article on housing, you know, who is already doing the articles on health disparities or a success story, who is covering, you know, one of our community leaders. So create, cultivate it, it takes time, as you know, Angel may attest, you know, call calls are very hard to be successful. This is, of you know, over the years, you have to create this connection. And so I would say that that is an important, you know, for schools and school boards 
to be involved and connected to the media and create that ecosystem that then, you know, it creates an organic relationship. So I think that makes a big difference. And, you know, again, I would say that uh, I know there are so many issues to tackle, but we, we really think that we have a lot to work with and that change is possible. And I think that um, some of the things that we're doing at Unidos US in collaboration with LPPI and Berkeley and our affiliates is to really connect different sectors, you know, from philanthropy, corporate America, and the media industry, of course, and the work that a, a Congressman Castro is doing. So journalists, publishers, advocates, you know, they all can play a role. And I think so for journalists, you know, again, I think people need to leave today saying, you know, we have to think what questions are we asking and who are the sources that we're referring to? I think that is the most important in addition to those recruiting and hiring practices. Um, and also, again, for advocates and the community in general, how I like seeing the chat people asking, how is the process? Because I'm sending my op -ed. So, you know, understanding, you know, how can we build closer relationships with the media outlets. How, that, how does it really work? And you know, for scholars, I think we can help them forge connections to the media. We have, you know, USLA can attest to this. There is just so much knowledge and data about our community that is not making to our policymakers. Right. You know, and the Latino agenda is the US agenda. So I think we have to create accessibility on how we can access the data how can policymakers can access that data? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, well, we're out of time. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for joining us here today and LPPI for doing the hard work behind the scenes to gather this data. Um, clearly, there's a lot of work to be done, but you know we'll take our our successes where we you know where we can. Um, also, I just want to note um, for those who um, want to receive more information and invitations, um, the staff put um, the link to the website latino.ucla.edu. Um, if you want to receive uh, more information. Thank you all for joining us and have a good week.